My name is Kevin Shavinsky. I am the co-founder and CEO of Modulus, and uh, we're excited to be part of uh, this event, and we're really excited to be part of the data-centric AI movement. So today, I'd like to talk to you about how to build better and fairer models with data-centric AI. Basically, how the data-centric AI approach helps you build models that are better, they're more accurate, but also fairer, that is, they make uh, fairer decisions on the lives of people. And I think that's an extremely important aspect of data-centric AI that should be stressed more. So I've uh, divided my presentation into three parts. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about what data-centric AI is, uh, go a little bit into the background of that, and our specific approach at Modulus and how we do uh, data-centric AI. I'll then talk a little bit about some uh, concrete data-centric AI use cases that make it really clear and visual how our approach can help you build those better and fairer models. And as a third part, I'll talk about how the data-centric AI philosophy and the data-centric AI approach connects uh, to upcoming AI regulation. Uh, most of that, of course, coming from the European Union, uh, but soon will uh, have a much uh, felt impact around the world as other countries adopt the de facto standard coming from the European Union. So there's this famous statistic that something like 60 to 80% of AI projects fail. And the reason given for that is that poor data quality leads to problems. There are all these other issues that uh, AI initiatives face, lack of clear business objective, lack of collaborations between teams, uh, too much sp time spent building models on, on, on bad data, of course, lack of talents and skills, uh, bad AI project management, uh, but ultimately at the center of the problem is poor data quality. So data is ultimately responsible for the performance of any AI or machine learning system. What makes an AI system work is in specific code, but the data. Uh, all pro progress in algorithm means is actually more time to spend on the data. Uh, said by Andrew Ng, the, uh, the main thought leader behind the data-centric AI movement. Uh, data scientists get frustrated when they spend most of their time working on cleaning the data. It's a, uh, it's a very time-consuming, very labor-intensive uh, type of work to do. And um, the data flaws and biases that are there in real-world data uh, are, are, not, are basically reflected in the model that you, you, you build based on it. And that results in hundreds of hours of wasted fine tuning a model based on bad data. So this is where uh, the data centric AI movement comes in. And this is also reflected, of course, what the practitioners say. So here's the AI infrastructure ecosystem report uh, put together by the AI infrastructure Alliance. And they ask practitioners, uh, what part of their AI ML infrastructure should receive the most resources? Uh, talent, time, money, and, and people were asked to, to rank the different parts of the infrastructure. And by far, number one was collecting, curating, and cleaning data sets. So that is a, another way of saying that the biggest blocker to implementing AI ML successfully, especially in, in an enterprise environment, is the quality of the data. And this is, of course, where the data-centric AI approach comes in. And uh, to summarize what the data-centric AI approach really is, we'll fo focus first on the model-centric uh, ML development model, where we take some data, which you usually get from the business, uh, we freeze it, and then we iterate on the model, on the architecture, on uh, the setup of the model, um, until we converge on the best possible performance. Uh, that can be incredibly time-consuming and resource-consuming as you train and resource models, but is limited by the data, right? Because you uh, are limited by the accuracy or the fairness that your data allows. In the data-centric machine learning uh, development uh, framework, you try to automate most of the model training, model building, because uh, ultimately, the model reflects the data, and you spend most of your time on improving the data. And improving the data has many different facets to it, which, which I'll get to later. And uh, uh, those interventions on the, on the data, of course, are would result ultimately in better performing models. So in the traditional AI development model, uh, the lengthy development cycle basically comes from the fact that 
uh, the data quality is not really well addressed. It's addressed at the beginning. It can be extremely expensive to get all your data clean labeled. Maybe you're papering over missing values with some clever imputation. Um, but all those processes, as costly as they are, ultimately don't really add all that much information, especially in the data imputation part. Data labeling can also be an issue when you outsource your labeling to third-party providers where you don't know whether the labels provided by them are, are actually accurate or are actually useful in improving your model. Um, there's also uh, an emerging problem, uh, emerging visibility of the problem, that is the lack of collaboration between teams. So uh, the data scientists may know the machine learning aspect of the project really well, but they may not be well versed in the business objectives where the ROI of uh, machine learning project uh, projects really is. And they may not be experts in the data because the data probably comes from some other part of the business. And so the data scientists, as data literate as they are, they may not know the ins and outs of how that data was generated and what it means and how to really go about uh, correcting, cleaning, and curating that data. Uh, another blocker in uh, the, the model-centric approach, of course, is black box AI, as regulators and the business side ask for explanations of why models behave the way they do. And all of this adds up to high failure rates. The data-centric approach, uh, the goal is really to reduce the time to market, to increase the ROI, um, reduce the cost of curating data by being more targeted about it, and by bringing in uh, the domain experts in the business by fostering collaboration inside uh, the organizations, because as I said before, the knowledge about what the data means is not necessarily with the data scientists. Uh, what also becomes much more important is the aspect of uh, regulation, trustworthy, explainable, responsible AI are going to be uh, uh, much higher, uh, put on a much higher value in, in the coming years as the EU AI Act becomes a reality and as governments around the world uh, pass legislation that mandate uh, that AI be trustworthy, explainable, and responsible. Uh, it also, the data-centric AI approach also, almost by definition, implies that the humans in the loop, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, coming impositions on uh, at least high-risk AI systems, um, that are going to be required by governments, that a person thought about the data that they're using to build an AI model and thought about that AI model and what its implications are. And of course, data-centric AI is recognized as an up-and-coming trend. Uh, so here's uh, the obligatory slide from Gartner highlighting data-centric AI as one of the top trends in data and analytics for 2022. And uh, uh, the analysis from Gartner really highlighted the fact that if you don't have the right data, then building AI systems is risky and potentially dangerous. So uh, again, taking a data-centric approach uh, to AI and improve your data system-based guidance means uh, you de-risk your AI initiatives. There are, of course, thought leaders that think about how AI should look like in the future. And of course, the, the, the main person that has done the most to popularize data-centric AI is Andrew Ng. Uh, and he summarized it better than I think uh, anybody else could when he said that the data-centric approach uh, to advancing AI has reached a point where the data is more important than the models. It's a really important observation. So if AI is seen as a system with moving parts, it makes more sense to keep the models relatively fixed while focusing on the quality data, data to fine tune the models rather than continuing to push for marginal improvements in the models. So what he's basically saying is that the models are a reflection of the data. And so if you want to get a model that is uh, more performant, uh, then you should uh, fix the data that the model is based on because it simply reflects the data. A good model does that. Our co-founder Tse Zhang said the same thing. A model is a reflection of the quality of your the underlying data. And so the importance of the data goes up. And so uh, the task of the data scientists should be finding data bucks, noises, and outliers that do the most harm to the utility of your machine learning application, uh, whether it's accuracy, fairness, or, or some other measure. And the data-centric approach, the way we see it at Modulus, 
is designed to give you those insights, those tools to do that, to essentially become a, a data bug hunter. So the way we look at uh, data-centric AI, the way we look at the process looks something like this. Our approach is to prioritize data issues based on uh, how important they are for the performance of the model. So first step is you should determine what you care about. This is the, the metric, your chosen metric. It could be accuracy, it could be F1 score, it could be a fairness metric like equalized odds. And then you compute the importance of different issues, different data issues, whether they're missing data, insufficient data, wrong labels, outliers, you know, whatever the issue is, for the performance of the model. And then you iterate, right? So you basically get a ranking of how important each issue is, you take action based on it, and then you retrain your model to see if fixing those most important issues had an outsized impact on the performance of the model. And then you continue that loop and you continue cleaning and you get that system-based feedback on what's wrong with your data and what will most what is most likely to improve your model. So uh, our platform, uh, the modulus platform, consists of, of two components. It consists of an automated machine learning engine, which is uh, built to make it really easy to train different types of models. Uh, we built it to be uh, simplest, simple, but not simplistic. So uh, we have a, a wide range of different types of models and configurations that you can all set. But the idea of our AutoML is that you, you simply set it up, you run it, and you get a stream of increasingly good models. Uh, our second module, and this is what makes us unique, is, is what we call the data quality management model, which is the phase where we give you that system-based advice on where your training data set has flaws, how important they are, and what you could do about them. And those play together as you go back and forth between the recommendations and the automated machine learning. So the, the way that we see the data-centric AI workflow and the way that uh, we design our platform looks something like this. You start with your data set. You use automated machine learning to find and train machine learning solutions. You select the model that you wanna work with and then you freeze the model and start to assess its performance. And then you get your prioritized recommendations on how to improve the data quality. You take actions on the data set, not the model, and then you retrain the model to see if the impact's been in the right direction. And maybe your score has improved sufficiently for you to go and move on to, to production, but chances are your first iteration, your first loop around the cycle was insufficient. And so you go back and you assess performance and you get a new set of recommendations and you take new actions and you retrain the model and you go around until you're satisfied with uh, the performance of the model. And then you pass it on to the further stages of um, deployment of ML ops of uh, registry monitoring and all that. Now, central to, to this loop is the human intervention. So the human data scientist taking these, those recommendations filtering them through business requirements and realities around uh, how, to, how, how it is even possible to improve the data, take that action and then get new feedback based on what they were able to do. Now, there are real world constraints here. So you may get a recommendation that says, get more labels, but maybe in your particular use case, that's not possible. So maybe the, the, the most uh, actionable uh, recommendation that the system gives you actually has no value to you because it cannot be realistically implemented or maybe it's just too expensive or time consuming to do it. So then you need to move down in the list of recommendations and uh, see what else you can do realistically to improve the performance of your model and to the quality of your data. So uh, our DQM module is based on the idea that uh, smarter data cleaning for machine learning is, is essential. So it's targeted. And that's what makes it faster. It's a tight feedback loop between the data and the model. And that means when you go and clean and curate and label the data, you do it in a uh, fast and cost-efficient way that you're oriented towards an objective. You're not just cleaning the entire data set. 
um, you're cleaning the most uh, important aspects, the most important samples of the data to improve your model performance. So the way you do that is you set an objective. Uh, so each um, data quality management loop has to be based on an, an objective. And uh, that could be accuracy, could be balanced accuracy, or it could be uh, any number of other metrics. And it could be in particular um, a measure of fairness, like equalized odds, equalized opportunity, et cetera. So that when you want a model that is fairer, you get recommendations on where the sources of bias and discriminations in your data are. So what do these actual system-based uh, guidance, what does it look like? It's essentially feedback on every single um, sample in your data. And uh, you have a possible set of actions here, right? So you could add a missing feature, you could add a missing label, you could fix a noisy label, you could fix a noisy feature, you could uh, rebalance the, sam uh, the data set by adding more samples or deleting samples. So you could add samples that, that are most like those that improve your model performance, or you could delete those that are most detrimental to your performance. Now, of course, those are the most radical steps. And maybe first you want to see if uh, adding or correcting uh, labels or features um, has, has a bigger impact before you take the drastic step of actually rebalancing the data set. Um, but uh, the tools that we give you, the quantitative tools that we give you, also uh, tell you what has the biggest impact. So we have a set of different modules. We use uh, Shapley values and influence functions to give you the relative importance to the performance of the model of each individual sample. Um, and you can both look at the, the value or, or the ranking based on those computations. Um, they basically tell you the, the marginal contribution of each sample in your training set to um, the model performance. And that results in uh, you taking action on the ones that are the worst or maybe be inspired by the ones that are the best, but basically all the operations are possible. Uh, you could also, uh, if your data set has missing labels, you could identify those samples with missing labels that have the most impact, right? So you get a, a ranking of um, the labeling priority of uh, where you should start labeling. It's particularly exciting if getting new labels is, is expensive for you. So uh, if, you, uh, if it is time consuming or, or it costs a lot to get those labels, maybe you want to start with the ones that are likely to have the highest impact. And then, of course, there are the outliers where, again, you uh, want to detect them and maybe take action based on the outlier recommendation. Now, what I want to stress here is that these are recommendations. These are not um, something you should automatically implement. So, for example, if we tell you that a particular sample is, is, a, is, is the number one outlier in your data set, you should look at it and you should use your domain expertise and say, mm, actually, that particular sample is, is not an outlier. I want to keep that. It doesn't matter that it's degrading my model performance. It's important that it stays in there. And so that human in the loop here is extremely important in, in, in our opinion. You can actually combine the different um, uh, metrics, the system-based guidance, uh, into where you should take action. So, for example, um, samples that have a low uh, influence function rank and a low Shapley rank, uh, you should prioritize for cleaning and you should start looking at the label because that's most likely what's wrong with it. Or you could look for a low Shapley rank for something that is probably not an outlier. And then again, that's something as a high likelihood of having an incorrect label. So you can combine those different metrics that we can compute for your data to really figure out where to look and what to do about it. And this is why we call it system-based guidance. So with that set up, I now want to move to some data-centric AI use cases. So how do we, how do we use these tools that I've described now in, in a very abstract sense? How do we uh, um, employ them in a real-world use case? So first one is, is a very nice visual one. Uh, using a data set that, of course, many of us are familiar with, this is the MNIST database of handwritten uh, digits. So as an experiment, what we did here is we took 10,000 10, images from the MNIST data set and we corrupted 1% or 100 
uh, labels in this data set. Uh, we also used a validation data set of 10,000 images uh, where the labels are correct. And we wanna know if with our approach to data-centric AI, we can detect the 1% wrongly labeled training data. Basically those in, that in a real world use case would limit our model performance. So if we just do take the random cleaning approach and started looking through our training data, uh, we would see something like this. So these are randomly selected. And because only 1% of the, uh, the training samples have a wrong label, if we just take a random sample, basically they're all correct. So the eight is labeled as an eight, the two is labeled as a two, the eight is labeled as an eight and so forth. So if we were just given the task of cleaning that data set and find the 1% that's uh, incorrectly labeled, you'd have to go through the whole data set which is time consuming and actually also error prone because if you, especially if you're doing it by hand, eventually you grow tired and maybe make a mistake. If instead you follow our recommendations and basically say uh, which samples most degrade the accuracy of our image classifier, uh, we get the following. So here I'm showing you the top 25 samples suggested for cleaning using our influence functions uh, module. We can see that almost all of them are incorrectly labeled. So if you start at the top uh, left, you have a clearly a five labeled as a four, you have a four labeled as a six, you have a two labeled as a five and so forth. So these are clearly wrongly labeled. It's only a small number of objects. We could relabel those manually very, very quickly and then get a, a measurable impact on any model that's trained based on these data. Second use case I wanna show you is, um, uh, well, it's less abstract, but it's still out of this world a little bit. So I have a background in astrophysics. So what I have here is um, some images of galaxies. And uh, one of the main tasks that astronomers studying galaxy evolution have is uh, telling the morphology or shape of the galaxy. And actually people using deep learning approaches to galaxy morphology has been a very um, popular method. And uh, training data, of course, is hard to come by because it's quite uh, hard work to label those galaxies. And even then you might have um, bad labels. So what we've done here is we've taken the training data set of 1500 galaxies taken uh, with a telescope. This telescope's actually in New Mexico uh, and it's been scanning the sky for, for a very, very long time and has actually millions of galaxies in its database. Um, and we've taken 200 of those labels and flipped them. So the, the two, two categories that we have for galaxies, uh, the broadest classification of galaxies is whether they're spiral galaxies, kind of like our Milky Way, or whether they're elliptical galaxies, so uh, football or, or rugby ball shaped uh, blobs of stars. And we have a validation data set of 590 images in this case where all the labels are correct. So again, we wanna see, can we find the wrongly labeled galaxies? And the answer is, if we just look randomly, uh, we find um, that all the galaxies are more or less correctly labeled. So you see the ellipticals, the blobs, the sort of reddish color, and you see the spirals where you see the spiral arms and the structure around them labeled as spirals. So they're basically all correct. If we follow our targeted recommendations and we use influence functions, um, and we look at the top 25 uh, highlighted galaxies, we find they're basically all incorrectly uh, labeled. So um, there's a lot of labels here as elliptical, and most of these galaxies are clearly spiral galaxies, they're clearly wrongly labeled. And so uh, again, with our approach to influence functions, we could now uh, take a targeted uh, measures to correct those labels, retrain the model and have a more accurate classifier so that we can go and classify those millions or billions gal of galaxies that are in, in our data set that we wanna study for science. So to summarize here, uh, I've given you two examples where uh, our data center approach, our influence function approach makes it really easy to help you find um, mislabeled, incorrect, wrong, uh, polluted uh, data samples in your training data that you can then fix in a targeted way to build a more accurate and re reliable model downstream. Now, what's also interesting here is that, of course, you can then backpropagate those data errors back to your ground truth storage. So if you took your data from, from a database, you might want to take those corrections 
that you made and uh, take them back to your ground truth storage because they were clearly wrong. And I think that has uh, huge implications for how we do not just machine learning, but data quality management uh, in a wider sense. Because of course, once you use the data for machine learning and you follow the, the modulus approach to identify errors, uh, you, you, you don't want to then just discard them and, and leave them with your machine learning project. You want to take them back to your original data storage. The third use case I want to share with you uh, goes in the direction of fairness. So this is uh, in the topic of um, uh, ethical AI, of trustworthy AI, and the kind of applications for AI machine learning that's going to be very heavily regulated in the coming future. And uh, I'll show you how the data-centric approach can help you build better machine learning models, more trustworthy machine learning models. So use case here is, is a real world data set and it's about uh, customers of a bank, retail customers, who uh, want to apply for a personal loan, so a mortgage, a car loan, a consumer loan, something like that. And the bank wants to decide whether this person is an acceptable un or unacceptable credit risk based on their past history, their credit history, um, and uh, essentially use that data, this existing data, to train a machine learning model to make those decisions. Now, the objective here is to make a fair model to assess loan eligibility, and in particular, one that minimizes bias, in this case, towards the protected attribute of gender. Because what happens when you take this data set, um, so it's a very interesting data set. It has not just the loan specific details, it has also the personal attributes. So you know about the sex, the age, the marital status of the applicants, uh, in addition to whether they applied for loans before, how much they're applying for, whether they have a guarantor. And they have the past credit history, right? Like how long have they been with the bank? Do they have a good repayment history, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all the information here to make a good credit model. Of course, that's really uh, a simple task. We, we train a model based on, did people like that repay their loans in the past? And if we analyze uh, this data set, we find that it reflects the, uh, the reality of the world where humans made flawed and biased decisions. And so, first of all, the data set is unbalanced in favor of male applicants. Uh, only 10% uh, or so of the applicants were women. And uh, in particular, uh, young women faced a uh, um, much stronger uh, bias, much longer rate of uh, acceptability of the loan than the men. So if we train a machine learning model based on these data, we'll get a machine learning model that may be accurate in forecasting whether uh, you should make this person a loan, but you'll have a, bi you'll have a bias. You'll have a, a bias based on gender and you'll make unfair decisions and depending on where you're based, probably also illegal decisions. So if you go through this uh, data set on, on our platform and you, you iterate between model and data, you can start to uh, say, I, I want to not just have an accurate model, I want to have a model that uh, optimizes for uh, a fairness metric. And you do a few loops and you basically um, curate, edit, and clean the data set so that your model is still accurate, uh, but it now has a much more favorable fairness profile. And what that does is it, of course, rebalances the data set, but it tells you much more than that. It basically tells you what the source of your bias really was. And what you learn is that in order to make the model fairer, you have to focus not just on removing um, some uh, noisy data or broken data. What you really had to focus on and remove was women whose decisions were unfair. So they got the, the, the incorrect decision based on uh, uh, their, their other attributes. And so by removing those incorrect decisions, those unfair decisions, you can move the, the credit model uh, towards one that is more fair, and it does so in a quantitative way. And you can see this here. This is basically taken straight off our, uh, off our platform, where we show you the evolution of fairness and accuracy um, uh, over iterations in the data-centric AI loop. So 
uh, when you start uh, at the beginning, you train a classifier and it has a, some level of accuracy. And you can see this in the orange dashed line here on the left, where we follow our recommendations, and on the right, where we sort of take a traditional uh, approach to trying to clean and rebalance the data set. So the orange line is the accuracy, and then the blue line is a fairness measure. So this is the equalized odds measure. And in, in this case, a lower number is better. So a fair classifier has a, a measure of essentially approaching zero. Now, if you just take the conventional or uh, naive approach uh, to fairness and you start basically rebalancing the data set so you have a more equal distribution of men and women, you'll find the outcome on the, on the right where you basically the accuracy of your model bounces back and forth a little bit, the, the orange line, the dashed line, um, and the fairness bounces around uh, as well, but basically it doesn't improve. You, you just end up with uh, a smaller data set and uh, a model that, that is not fit for purpose. If instead you follow our recommendations and clean curate, uh, remove precisely those samples which were cause for discrimination, you see the behavior on the left where iteratively the equalized odds score goes towards zero. Now, of course, there's a trade-off as you do that, the accuracy goes down uh, somewhat as well, but here you now not only have built a fair model that's as fair and accurate as it can be, uh, you also, and this is really interesting and important in light of all these upcoming regulations, you have uh, a, a log, a track record of what you did to try and make the fairest and most accurate model possible. So if somebody asks you, what did you do to make your model fair? Well, here's your record. You can show what you did. You did your best job. And then you made a business decision over how much accuracy you sacrificed in order to uh, achieve a fair model. And this is going to be demanded, as I said earlier, by the regulator. But it's also, especially if you're in a, a B2C area, it's going to be demanded by your customers. They want to be using products and services where even particularly when they're powered by, by AI, that uh, that are fair, that are equitable, that are just. And that leads me to the third part of my talk about how data-centric AI connects to upcoming AI regulation. And so uh, I believe that um, the coming years is gonna see a huge shift in how AI is used in the real world, because up until now, we could basically do almost anything. And so AI was barely constrained by existing uh, legal and regulatory frameworks. And so over the last few years, many countries around the world have introduced policies, strategies, guidelines, uh, voluntary codes about how artificial intelligence should be used in particular uh, when those uh, products and services affected uh, the lives of individual citizens. So uh, here's a list just from the OECD that they compile of all these uh, documents and measures. Um, but for the most part, they're suggestions or, or guidelines. And this is about to change. And it's going to change in a dramatic and fundamental way with the European AI Act. So this act is uh, in the process of being negotiated. It will be voted on soon. And it's going to set the global standard for mandatory regulation of AI. Now, this document has been in the works for many, many years now, and there are still parts of it being negotiated. And so I have a, a big uh, caveat here that um, what I'll tell you now uh, may not fully correspond to the final act because we don't know yet what it will look like. And so what I'm going to describe to you is the, the broad outline of the provisions that we know based on the published draft and the latest reports on the negotiations between legislators, regulators, and, and stakeholders in Europe about how this act should work, what it should cover, and, and what its scope should be. The first thing that's really interesting about the AI Act, and so, so you see I have a, a little disclaimer now at the bottom of the slide, subject to ongoing negotiations. Um, the first thing that's really uh, striking about the act is that it, it has an absolutely sweeping definition of what AI is. Uh, the reason the I, uh, EU proposed this is because they want to future-proof the act. So if new, entirely new methods 
for uh, a, building AI models comes along, they want to make sure that it's already covered and uh, it doesn't require a huge amendment to the act um, so that those new inventions can also be already be regulated. But if you read these definitions, it covers not just things that we would call AI, like machine learning approaches, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning, deep learning, et cetera. It also includes logic and knowledge-based approaches, uh, inductive logic uh, programming, knowledge bases, inference and deductive engines, expert systems, statistical approaches, Bayesian estimation, search and optimization methods. So many things that if you're an AI ML practitioner, you, you probably wouldn't include in um, your main domain are gonna be considered AI under this act and be regulated. Uh, so many companies that are not aware that they're doing quote unquote AI right now will wake up one day and realize that they're suddenly engaging uh, in a, uh, using a technology that is now regulated. Uh, the EU, EU is pro uh, proposing different risk categories. And the fundamental principle with these risk categories is essentially uh, the, the amount of impact that a uh, category has or an application has on the lives of citizens. Uh, it introduces an unacceptable risk category. And, and in the draft, at least, this is a specific list of banned uh, applications, such as uh, uh, society-wide um, scoring system, uh, uh, um, basically uh, similar to the system that China has. This is going to be totally prohibited. Um, then there are going to be high-risk applications. And those are going to be heavily regulated, uh, basically in a similar way to a medical device, where the development, deployment, uh, uh, et cetera, of the system has very extensive requirements uh, from robustness, documentation, uh, human in the loop, uh, um, many, many, many different requirements. And what's interesting is that the scope is unclear what exactly is going to be included in this high-risk category. And, and there are ongoing negotiations about what should be in it, what should not be in it. Um, there's, uh, e even with the existing uh, proposals, the scope is not entirely clear. So um, companies uh, using AI right now don't really have any clarity yet whether something they're doing already may suddenly be considered a high-risk application and essentially requiring a, a complete rebuild from scratch in order to meet those requirements. Limited risk applications uh, are systems that interact with people. Um, so the, the, the poster, uh, uh, poster child application here will be something like a chatbot, and it's going to be required, it's going to come with disclosure requirements. So the user has to know that they're interacting with an AI system. The lowest and minimal risk category are, I think, essentially systems not covered by any of the other. Uh, risk categories, and they are not going to face any of those new uh, legal requirements. The Obviously, the most interesting and important category is going to be the high-risk category, and what's going to be the big open question is, uh, where do you go from limited risk to high risk? And that's going to be not just an open question for the legislation, but then also um, the regulations that are going to be based on the EUA Act legislation. Now, before you say, well, you know, that, that's very interesting, but I'm, I'm not in the EU, so this doesn't really apply to me. Well, the EU AI Act uh, functions a little bit like GDPR. So it's going to have global and extraterritorial reach. So if your product or service is accessible to EU citizens, you're going to be regulated. So even if you're a provider in, in the U.S., uh, as long as EU citizens are uh, able to use your system, you're going to have to comply. Uh, like GDPR, it's a European regulation. Um, if you run a website, you're going to have to be GDPR uh, compliant if you're going to want to be able to serve visitors from Europe. And the same is going to be true of uh, AI systems. And the penalties per violation are set at 6% of global turnover or 30 million euros, whichever is higher. And I put an asterisk there. Uh, there's some uh, moves uh, to make the minimum fine lower than that because a 30 million euro fine would destroy uh, most SMEs. But the EU sees this as a, as a very important policy tool 
and sees this uh, as something that should be effective and deter even the largest companies from uh, offering building uh, AI systems that go against the principles and rules of the act. And so, as I mentioned before, the high-risk applications are going to be regulated similar to a medical device. So uh, at some point in the future, there may be um, manuals and guidelines with hundreds of pages of uh, requirements and flowcharts that describe how to prep your data, how to clean your data, how to build your system, how to test your system so that uh, your AI system in the high-risk category uh, may be deployed and maintained. And uh, there's still ongoing negotiations exactly uh, what's going to be covered here and what precisely requirements will be. But they're going to be um, a, a significant hurdle to building new AI systems. The governance of all of this is going to be run by the European Artificial Intelligence Board uh, at the top. But then there are going to be national regulators or boards that um, are going to implement regulations uh, based on national legislation. So there's a tension between the EU Act and the divergent national reg uh, uh, regulations that are going to come. That's going to be really clear. So as, as one example here, the EU AI Act never mentions the word fairness, even though one of the things that they feel most strongly about is that uh, AI models affecting people's lives don't, do not discriminate. And the reason for that is that um, every European country, of course, has different definitions of what fair, what discrimination, uh, what these words mean in, in the national legislations. And so um, there's going to be have, have to be some translations between the EU AI requirements and what it really means to have a fair credit model in Italy or in Spain or in Sweden. Now, uh, data quality is at the center of the AI Act. So I took this paragraph from the preamble of the, the draft act. So again, caveat emptor, this is not the final agreed legislation, but it is very clear that uh, training, validation, and testing data sets should be sufficiently representative and free of errors. So uh, that AI systems uh, avoid discrimination and bias. Now, free of errors, of course, if, if, if uh, you think about it for one second, is an impossible requirement to meet, and that will almost certainly change to something like as free of errors as possible. Uh, but it now becomes clear how uh, the data-centric AI approach meshes really, really well with these upcoming requirements. Uh, what are these requirements really going to look like if you go back to before the act, the foundational document um, that set in motion many of the ideas that are in the EU AI Act uh, is this document from uh, the uh, Europe, uh, set up by the European Commission. It's called the Seven Pillars of Trustworthy AI. Uh, it was um, published in 2019, and it basically said that the following uh, aspects to any AI product interacting with people is extremely important. So human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness, societal, environmental well-being, and accountability. So here, the, the, the mention of fairness is, is made explicit, and uh, this is also how it will come back into the requirements once legislation is uh, translated to regulations. So data-centric AI, we believe, is, is a very effective response to these complex new requirements. Uh, it promotes a human in the loop. So uh, at all aspects of the ML life cycle, a human is making the ultimate judgment calls about whether something is fair, transparent, or robust. It requires accountability for data subject matter experts. So the people uh, curating, cleaning, and editing the data should know what they're doing, should know what they're talking about. And again, leading to... Um, uh, data that is uh, better, fairer, and as free of errors as possible. Um, it tracks every action performed on the data and its impact on model performance. So uh, the EU AI Act is going to come with heavy audit requirements, especially for those uh, high-risk applications. So if you follow the data-centric approach to uh, building better models and improving your data quality, uh, you have a, a track record of what you did and why you did it. Uh, so that when you are audited, you can explain it. And, uh, you know, 
makes it easier to implement those accurate, fair, and robust machine learning models. So as a summary, uh, I presented what uh, data-centric AI is and how uh, our modulus uh, approach to data-centric AI looks like. Uh, I presented to you a number of uh, concrete AI use cases on how to improve the data quality, the data sets, uh, to get more accurate models, to build fairer models. And then I uh, finished with an overview of how upcoming AI regulation, driven primarily by the EU AI Act, is going to make uh, the data-centric AI approach uh, much more attractive since it meshes really well with the requirements of these upcoming regulations. Thank you very much.